Hi, everybody. I hope you can see me. If you have speaker view on, hopefully my face is very large in your screen, whatever kind of screen that is. Um, I'm Natalie Martin. I am a volunteer with Master Gardeners. Um, thank you for those of you that have gone along this Zoom journey with me. We have um, done a lot so far. Um, we have covered a lot of topics. Thank you for your patience in rescheduling this uh, program because uh, my power went out, who would have thought? And you don't think about that being an issue unless you need Wi-Fi and a computer and all sorts of things to make programs happen. So um, we're going to, one of the, we're gonna jump right in. We're gonna talk about specific plants that you can see in your garden. Hopefully if you went to Lisa's program um, last week, you learned about some birds that you might want to attract to your backyard. So this is actually really timely that we're showing it afterwards. I planned it all, it was all on purpose. Um, that you'll see it afterwards because if you did do that program, you'll know, oh, I want this bird in my yard, um, so I need to plant these plants. So that's what we're hoping to do today. Um, I am going to share my screen with you guys. Um, and the first thing that I'm gonna do is go through some resources. If you have seen the chat, um, in the, in there have, if you go down to the chat, I put a whole bunch of links in there. There's maybe about five links something like that. Um, and the, uh, the, one of the links that we have is going to be this, the journey to restore native habitat, which is, this is a, um, publication by the Audubon Society, um, Illinois Audubon. So this is going to be a guide on how to change, you know, um, get your yard going to attract specific birds. This is going to cover specific plants that you can um, have in your yard. Um, it doesn't have what those plants look like. So that's going to be um, what we want to do with our next link that I'm going to show you. So that's a really great link. That's going to be specific resources. The, um, the Illinois Audubon link is great for um, specific, specific plant suggestions to attract birds and which season the, they will bloom in then you can head over to I'm not we also have a, a great uh, wildflower um, uh, website through the Illinois Extension feel free to use that one I like the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center as well um, some of it is skewed towards Texas because it is based in Texas but um, they have a lot of really cool searches that you can do they have live events um, that you can do um, and then you can go to this thing it says plant lists um, and this has by state, it has what kinds of lists of plants it has. If you go down, it'll have plants for pollinators and the specific types of pollinators, um, regional wildflowers. I'm just going to click on the Illinois list really quick because this was really great. And this has pictures. Um, so you could find 78 pictures of red maples um, and different things like that. So this is, this is a place that you can find specifically Illinois recommended um, plants, trees, um, and shrubs uh, that you can plant in your yard. And you can search, um, narrow it down by sun, part shade, shade, what type of soil you have, um, what type of time they'll bloom, what color they'll bloom in. So it's a really great um, search re tool. So that link is also um, in your chat. Um, and then there's a few more. Uh, these are going to be just really quick and handy guides on specific grasses, perennials, things like that, that can um, attract birds. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble with where my, there we go, I got to move. Um, and then this one is from the Cornell Labs. And um, I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with the Merlin app. It's an app you can get on your phone to identify birds. Um, and that Cornell is the company that makes that. They are very popular. Um, they've been doing bird research and bird publications for years and years. And this had a really, another really great quick reference about different types of plants and what, they're, um, what kinds of birds that they will attract. And then my very last link, and I know that I kind of went through and jumped right into these, but they are all in that chat box that you can see them. Um, but this is uh, a guide to, there's not going to be all inclusive. These are not even all Illinois birds, um, but they're just a quick picture guide um, to specific birds. Um, and this is where I got a lot of the pictures from in my um, my presentation. So if we wanted to pick maybe like a northern flicker, this is a bird that you can find in Illinois. If we clicked on it, it would take you to this really cute little image. It would have a couple suggestions on what kinds of plants that would um, attract this specific bird. Um, so I thought that was kind of cool. 
Um, so those were just some handy tools. Like I said, um, if you head down to the chat function, uh, you can get to those um, and, uh, and see those for yourself, check them out. Um, but we will jump right in to the presentation. Um, like I said, this is landscaping for birds. So these are, this is gonna be about planting specific um, things in your yard. They, don't, they can be annuals, they can be perennials, they can be trees, shrubs, but using plantings and planting areas in your yard to attract specifically with the goal of attracting birds. Um, I'm going to stop sharing temporarily so you can see my face because I have a quick uh, tutorial about um, if you are, you know, saying, you know, well, I want to attract birds right away. I don't want to worry about, um, uh, you know, waiting for plants. You know, you can use some seed. And if you think about what birds eat, you know, a lot of times you think about seed. I don't know if you can see this, but this is my seed mix that I make for my yard. And it's 50 50 um, black oil sunflower, which are these sunflower seeds. I don't know if you can see them. Um, and then it's cracked corn. And this attracts a variety of different types of birds. It's a quick tool. Um, I'm not anti-bird feeders. A lot of people, um, there are some uh, people out there that are anti having artificial food sources. I'm not judgy, um, but I thought I would show you at least some a suggestion. I get that at Rural King. You can buy a 50 pound bag of each one. It's fairly affordable. Um, and I have uh, the another thing I wanted to show you guys, but I'm going to jump on the screen sharing and we'll kind of just go over um, what we're going to cover today. Uh, so the main goal, how do I bring birds to my yard? Um, you're going to, we're going to go through kind of these four different things today. Uh, what do birds need? What kind of birds do you want? Because that's going to be the ultimate goal, right? If you want hummingbirds, you know, that we're going to talk about how to bring hummingbirds to your yard. If you want uh, woodpeckers, those kinds of things. Um, what kinds of plants should I choose? We're going to go over, I'm going to have a really long list of plants. All of them are available in those resources that I sent out earlier. So don't get overwhelmed. Um, if you do have a tablet, um, if you're on a tablet or a phone, smartphone, you can take a screenshot of those slides or you can request I can send them to you. But all of those resources are in the links that I sent out. So don't get overwhelmed and feel like you have to, um, uh, you know, uh, get it all at once. Um, and then helpful tools and resources. And that's just going to be a continuation of um, what, uh, what we talked about in those resources. Okay, so what do birds need? Um, I'm going to do a little quick bird beak uh, demonstration. So if you can see my um, bird, every bird beak is not created equal. Um, all bird beaks, you know, that's going to be um, determining what kinds of food they're going to eat. So we'll talk a little bit more about bird beaks, but I thought I'd do a little tutorial. I have three different imaginary bird beaks here. Um, and this type, whatever their beak is, that, um, oh good, Meg says that bird feeders do not interrupt. I know that there are some very judgy people out there. Meg says that bird feeders do not interrupt natural feedings, and that's great news. So in case some, if, if you have run into um, somebody that is judgy-wudgy about having feeders in your yard, we heard it from an ornithologist that that's not true. So um, I'm not a judgy wedgy person, so don't worry. Um, so if we look at a bird beak, imagine that this is a bird beak. How it's formed, how it's shaped is gonna be determining what kind of food it eats. Um, a, a, this would be maybe more like a spoonbill. It's got a little bit of a scoop to it. Um, you can scoop things up, hold it in there, and then eat it. So that's gonna be kind of an example. Something like this is gonna be more of, um, it's gonna be more precise. It's gonna be getting seeds, maybe from the inside of a pine cone. It's gonna to have to get inside in a very narrow area and pluck something out. And then something like this, this is huge, but if we're thinking about something that sucks things up, this is just a very large version of what a hummingbird's beak could be like. So um, you have to think about when you are even putting a feeder in your yard or you are thinking about um, what kinds of plants you're gonna plant. Think about what kind of birds you're gonna attract because of how their beak is formed is gonna determine how they're gonna be able to eat. But in general, what do birds need? Food, shelter, and water. Just like humans, just like most other animals, um, you know, they're, they're gonna need those very three specific things. So if you have a diverse um, bunch of resources available in your yard, you're gonna have a diverse bunch of birds. 
Um, not every species can eat the same food. So if you want to have um, two or three different kinds of species, you'll have to make sure that you know what they're gonna eat. If you don't wanna plant a big variety, you'll wanna make sure that the food sources that you provide are gonna serve a lot of different species of birds. Um, shelter. Uh, birds use plants and shrubs and trees for all sorts of different things. Even grasses birds use as nesting material, either material or they will nest right in tall grasses. So think about that. Um, food sources are great, but if a bird has to fly a far distance to get to your food source, they're not going to go to it very often. They're only going to go to it when they're passing through. So um, if you do not have shelter areas, um, the birds are not going to feel safe feeding there for a long period of time. And then water, uh, fresh water, you know, put up bird baths, things like that. You're going to be changing that bird bath often. Um, fresh running water sources are very nice for birds. That's why you see a lot of birds bathing in puddles because um, that rainwater puddle is fresh. Um, they know that they're not going to have bacteria in it that they're putting on themselves or, or drinking, consuming. So um, you want to make sure that if you are using a bird bath, you are changing that water very frequently. And you also want that water to be um, protected from predators. And we'll talk a little bit more about fresh water, but um, if you have a bird bath that's in a dish that's sitting down on a surface and neighborhood cats could get to it, um, other sorts of prey species like coyotes or, or um, sorry, predator species like coyotes or raccoons, um, you want to make sure that that bird is going to feel secure. So that's why a lot of bird baths are set a couple feet off of the ground so that birds can feel a little bit more protected um, from, prey, uh, from predator species. So then we're going to talk about our food and our shelter a little bit more. Like I said with the beak demonstration, not all beaks are created equal. So um, you can think about um, fruit, uh, different food types. It's just like about five main types. Nectar, that's going to be, you know, that syrupy sweet liquid that's inside a flower. That's going to be attracting pollinators, any sort of pollinator like a butterfly or a bee, um, different sorts of flies, um, and then hummingbirds. That's a, a nectar is a great source for hummingbirds. Um, so you want to plant if a nectar. All flowers are going to have some kind of nectar. Some are going to have more than others, and we can talk more about that. Um, and some flowers are spe they're specifically designed to bring pollinators, attract pollinators. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Seeds. I think, you know, we talked about sunflower seeds, you know, that's a very notable variety. Um, so seeds are going to be another source, but your beak has to be able to crack through that outer hole. Um, and acorns, you know, not a lot of birds eat acorns because their holes are so big. So you got to think about what kinds of um, birds would have a strong enough beak to break through those seed holes to get to that good, you know, a protein rich seed on the inside. Berries are a great source of um, energy for birds, very high sugar. Um, but if you think about having some berries in your yard, if anybody has a mulberry tree like I do, we all know what happens when you bring birds to a mulberry tree. And that is they poop purple poop all over everything in your whole yard. So it's another thing to think about when you're um, bringing a berry variety into your um, yard that whatever the birds eat is gonna have to come back out again. So um, make sure that, that that's kind of something, you know, you don't wanna plant a mulberry tree and then be really upset later when your car is just painted purple. So think about that. Insects, scrubs, or worms, um, that's not necessarily something that you can plant a plant for, but um, you can, uh, definitely, you can bait things like there's um, worm foods that you can get and suet foods um, that you can get that have worm pieces and things like that. But um, that's just a, another uh, food source for certain types of birds to keep in mind. Obviously, everyone has seen robins going after worms um, in, you know, after a rain. So, you know, that's something that's going to hopefully naturally occur in your yard. And bringing more different types of plants will bring pollinator bugs, things like that, which can be eaten by birds. And then small mammals. I'm hoping you're not growing any small mammal plants out in your yard. I've never heard of that. Um, but that's going to be a, um, you know, things like hawks, owls, um, those kinds of things. Those are going to be small mammal prey, uh, you know, uh, they're going to prey on small mammals. So that's not something that necessarily you can attract, but it's just something that you know, it's a different type of food source. Um, carnivorous birds do exist, so I thought I'd just throw it in there to talk about. Shelter. 
Shelter provides a couple different things. If you think about your house that you live in, it provides you with a variety of different things. Protection from predators, you know, protection from the elements, nest sites. Um, birds need areas that, um, that, that they can uh, lay their eggs in that are gonna be protected from predatory animals that eat eggs, also protected from the elements that'll stay dry, um, stay away from pests. Um, because things like flies and, and bugs can't eat or ants can't eat eggs. Um, if you look at this picture of the northern flicker, um, it has a very specific nesting um, behavior and that, you know, it has this hole up in a tree. It'll be a certain kind of distance above the ground um, and it picks specific trees that it knows it can hollow out their type of wood um, and it'll have, you know, food sources nearby and things like that. So, um, that's gonna be, you know, nesting sites, bushes provide great nesting sites. If anyone has seen like those thick um, juniper you know, shrubs that you have a lot of times in commercial uh, landscaping, they are full of sparrows and different things like that. Um, but plants can also provide nesting materials. Um, down here, you can see in this picture, there's some tall grass. Birds will pick off, they'll eat the seeds of the tall grass, but they'll also pick the dried grass, different plant material and use that to pad their nests and things like that. And then feeding shields. Um, feeding shields, to kind of explain that, is it's an area that a bird can hide in close to a food source um, until it feels safe, and then it'll fly to that food source, eat the food, and then it'll fly back. Um, so you can uh, think about that as kind of a protective area um, that a bird can just like sit in and either eat the food that it just picked up or it can wait until it feels safe to go get more food. Um, you'll see this a lot with, um, with just sparrows that you see in parking lots. They'll have a little shrub or something nearby and then they'll fly down, pick up, you know, french fries or whatever that's on the ground and then fly back. Um, so that's a great example of a feeding shield. It would be something, an area that would be protected that birds would feel safe to sit in and, um, and find before they find food. And then the type of birds that you want to attract will determine the types of food sources, the types of plants that you'll want to plant. Um, I'm always a big um, proponent of planting natives, but specifically, you don't have to only plant native Illinois plants. Obviously, native Illinois plants are going to attract native Illinois birds. So that's going to be a, a guaranteed way to um, attract birds is by using native food sources. It's not something they have to figure out if it works for them. But if you aren't going to use only natives, no judgment here. Like I said, I'm not judgy. Um, but you want to avoid, avoid invasive species. So if for a um, you can do a little bit of research on this if you want to research each plant that you put in for sure. But an example would be mint, um, regular, you know, mint that you use for, for cooking and for baking. Um, if you plant that in a specific area and you don't make a barrier in any way, that mint is going to take over your whole yard. It grows really well. Um, it may not be, you know, some versions of mint are natives, but um, it, it can be completely invasive and choke out the rest of your plants. And yeah, some birds can use it as a food source once it flowers and things like that, but um, it will take over all of the rest of your plants in your area. So think about that as a common um, invasive species. Another um, invasive species would be garlic mustard. This would be in like woodlands and things like that. And garlic mustard, while you can eat garlic mustard, it's so prolific. It will just grow and grow and grow and completely take over your whole habitat. Um, and it'll choke out all the other plants. Um, and so in, it will just completely change it into a one, um, a one note landscape. So think about kind of when you're picking plants, you wanna pick something that is not known to be invasive. It's not hard, you can just do a quick Google. Um, and a lot of times if you're not sure when you're looking at a plant name, if you look at the scientific name, um, it, it'll, it'll list the specific scientific name. It'll, if, it, if it's a variety or a cross, it'll have X or V in there, or it'll have a common name like shooting star or something like that. Um, that's gonna be a hybrid. So you don't necessarily know for sure if that's gonna be a great Illinois native species. Um, so we will keep going on. We are uh, looking here at three different types of Illinois native birds. Each one of these birds is going to have um, a different kind of habitat that it's going to need. It's going to have different kinds of foods that um, it's going to eat from. So um, this is a white-breasted nuthatch. I love these birds. They're woodland birds here in Illinois. They're very common. Um, you see them a lot of times at feeders. You'll see them in woods. Um, they can uh, crawl up 
up and then also down. So you'll sometimes see them and look going what looks like down a tree. They can just go right up the surface of the tree. And you can see this hole here in a uh, nut that it's kind of pecked its way inside. So it's gonna be a big food source for it. It's a nut hatch. It's hatching open the nuts is kind of how you see how it gets its name. Um, it needs woodland forest. Like I said, so it, it's gonna, um, you're gonna need to plant woodland trees for that, lots of trees, it likes lots of shelter. Um, and then you're gonna need nut trees. Like we said, not a lot of birds can get into those acorns, um, but nut hatches can. So um, that's a good example of a, a bird that would um, use nuts. And if you actually look, we can talk about beaks. It's got that little needle point beak, but unlike with a, with a tweezers, it's, it's using it as a hammer. It's hammering away at those nuts that crack it open and kind of eat what's inside. And then we're gonna go over here to a hummingbird. A lot of people wanna plant hum or bring hummingbirds to the yard because they're beautiful, right? They're, um, and they're, the way they fly is cool. It's just, they're so neat and they're so beneficial because they're pollinating plants. Um, so there's a couple different pictured plants here. Um, I'll talk about this one down here because I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more, but this is Columbine. This is an Illinois native. Um, I think it just looks like fairy plants, you know, it's just so neat. And then this is a, um, like a trumpet vine on the right here, and this is a non-native. So um, there are some tr different kinds of vines and things like that that are native, but um, this one is a, a non-native plant. So you wanna plant plants and you can kind of see how they're shaped. They've got a little catch where the nectar goes. The hummingbird's gonna go right up into the inside and drink that nectar that's down inside the catchment in there. So um, you wanna have flowers that produce a lot of nectar to bring a hummingbird to your yard. And then this is a tufted titmouse. This is another woodland native species of Illinois. And he's a true omnivore in that he will eat everything. Ants, slugs, acorns, berries. They will eat just about anything and they can adapt really well to different things. So you can plant a variety of different things and, and titmice tit, tit will come to your yard. And they're so cute. They've got this little crested top head, you know, hat on. They've got these little dark eyes. They're just adorable. So uh, they're another cool Illinois bird, but they will eat a variety of different things. And this is that overwhelming set of slides that I talked about. This is going to be these huge um, lists of um, native species that will bring different types of birds to your yard. Sorry, I have to take a drink. But these are just a couple different categories of different types of food sources. Um, we've got winter fruits. So those would be fruits that come during the winter. Um, these are going to be things that hold on, um, you know, things like crab apples that will stay on trees for a long time. Um, conifers, and that's exactly what it sounds like. Evergreen trees, fine spruces, firs. Those things produce, you know, pine cones, um, different things like that. That would be the conifer, the pine cone, or that, that part of the tree would be the, the, the food source. Nectar, we just talked about those with the hummingbird. Wild grasses and forbs, so those would be tall grasses or things that are left to seed. Um, birds can use the grass parts for um, nesting material, but the seeds, they will eat the little seed heads. So whenever you're like really lazy about mowing your lawn, like I can be, um, and it goes to seed, well, hey, you're feeding native birds, good for you. Um, nuts and acorns, uh, we talked a little bit about those. Um, summer fruits and autumn fruits. So, you know, there's, when you, a, when a plant produces, you know, it has to, it has to spread its seeds and some birds or some birds, whew, some trees and plants will fruit out um, and the fruits will ripen in different times of the year. Not a lot of spring fruits. There are some that will be early summer, but um, especially here in Illinois, uh, spring is when the plant first puts out its flowers. So a lot of times the fruits will not be produced until summer, fall, or winter. So kind of think about that if you're thinking about um, year-round food sources for birds. There's not a lot in Illinois of spring fruits because the, the plants are just waking up from the winter and starting to produce again. Um, so you won't have some fruiting trees in the spring, but you can provide other plants to attract birds during that time. I'm gonna zoom in on each individual slide and talk a little bit about each individual um, kind of section. Uh, and kind of what might come to your area. Now, sometimes when you are in um, the a uh, like residential area, things like that, 
Some of these birds won't necessarily come here, like in this slide, turkeys. Um, I'm in Oglesby, so we do get turkeys that come through the yard, and so they may, if, you know, come visit your yard if you're not in a very busy residential area. But, um, you know, you can uh, kind of think about that that you may not get all of these, even if you plant specific plants with acorns or whatever that could attract turkeys. If your area is too busy, um, some of these bird species may not come to you. Um, but nuts and acorns, um, you can, these um, trees that provide nuts and acorns can provide not just the nut, but uh, some other types of food are um, supplies for birds anyway. So when they have their spring flowers, like I just said, when they've trees wake up and they have to produce, you know, start to uh, fertilize, they're going to produce their spring flowers. Well, insects are drawn to those, which then um, bring birds, um, spring mig migrating birds that can then eat those insects. So um, they don't just, they're trees are not just a one note kind of thing, but nuts and acorns, um, you know, oaks produce acorns, hickories, buckeyes, chestnuts, butternuts, walnuts, beeches, and hazels. These are all Illinois um, nut trees. Um, and those would provide, you know, we talked about titmice, we talked about um, nut hatches. Uh, some woodpeckers will uh, crack open acorns and nuts, depending. Um, but mass eaters, which it refers to on this, so that would be woodpeckers. You know, if you think about their pecking into the mass of the tree, that would be what a mass eater would be. And then these trees, which are a lot of times big, solid oak trees, um, can provide a nesting habitat for a lot of different kinds of species. Uh, summer fruits and autumn fruits. Um, these are going to be some very notable things that you heard about. Uh, you know, your raspberries, your cherries, those summer fruits. Um, those are going to provide, just like we love eating those fruits, so do birds. A lot of people, if you do grow those, you probably have to put up some netting or some sort of barrier to keep the birds away so you can actually get some of those fruits. Um, so kind of think about that. If you want to have some of those for your own usage, um, you may want to set aside some area if you want birds to eat them that um, is, is netted off so that you can save some for yourself. Um, mentioned some mulberries on here. Like I said before, I have four mulberry trees bordering my property and it is a purple fest. It will be for the probably the next couple weeks here. Um, so these are going to provide uh, high energy. Summer fruiting is going to provide high energy food sources um, for birds during the breeding season. So um, Spring, you know, they're finding mates and then they're going to uh, spring or, or early summer and then they're going to start um, laying their eggs and nesting and they need a lot of energy. So those fruits are going to provide high energy food sources. And then dog, um, I'm sorry, autumn fruits like dogwoods, um, you don't necessarily think of dogwoods as a fruiting species, but they have these bright red berries. The berries are beautiful, but then birds love them as well. But there's going to be other fall bearing fruits um, that will, the, the, they're serving a different purpose. So those summer fruits are for the mating season for nesting. Um, those uh, fall fruits are going to be great for migratory birds that are going somewhere else that have a long journey. They need high energy foods, foods that can keep them on, the, um, on their migratory journey. If they're non-migratory birds, they have to last all winter. So they have to eat and eat and eat and eat and eat, just like me, to get up their food sources to get through that long winter. So um, autumn fruits are great. Fruit trees, again, are gonna make a mess, but they could be worth it if you wanna bring some of those birds to your yard. And then winter fruits. You don't think about fruits that are gonna last winter. Um, we talked about crab apples a little bit, uh, cranberries, uh, Virginia creeper, winter berries, which also known as holly. Um, and those are going to be providing foods to keep those nat native birds that stay over the winter. It's going to keep them, um, you know, safe and alive during the winter. Um, you know, I always think, you know, you think about robins as the sign of spring. I always thought they migrated, but it turns out a lot of them just go into the forest and have to find food sources. But um, uh, pine grosbeaks are really pretty. Those are going to be drawn to um, fruit trees in the winter, wax wings. Um, cedar wax wings are, uh, they're actually my favorite bird, and they will go kind of area to area to area to find the fruiting trees um, through all throughout the season. So they're a really cool thing to see. Um, conifers. Uh, some birds, you have to really be adapted really well to extract seeds from conifers. And uh, northern finches are really cool. And I hope you can see my video because they have a cross bill. So if you see, you know, a normal beak you think of is like this. But a, a northern finch is like, it's a crossbill. So then when it opens, it can pry open 
the pine cone and then its tongue comes out and fishes out the little seed inside. So it's just really neat. Um, some hummingbirds can get the sap when they first return, they can use that sap as a good energy source until you know flowering flowers come back. Um, but they also provide great nest sites. They have coverage all year round. Um, so the birds can feel safe that their nest is in a good spot all year round. So there's some really great things about having conifers, even just shrubs um, nearby your, uh, your yard. Uh, nesting or nectar, nectar flowers, um, you usually think of those as specifically flowers. We talked some about those, um, uh, you know, uh, trumpet vines, things like that. Um, these are specifically going to be for things like hummingbirds, but also Orioles will drink a lot of nectar. You can also put out jam, uh, you know, jelly feeders and, and citrus fruits for Orioles. Um, but, uh, you know, they a lot of times will have bright red uh, corollas, which are the inner parts of the flowers, and that's going to attract these birds, but it also, you know, is going to be attractive to you. Um, the one thing that I always say when I'm talking about, you know, if you want to attract wildlife, you also have to enjoy it. So you want to pick things that are going to be attractive to you, as well as working well for birds. So think about that kind of when you're planning what you want. Uh, and wild grasses and forbs, just like we talked about, um, untrimmed wild grasses. Now, this is going to be one of those things that's a personal taste kind of thing. Like I said, you have to enjoy it too. And not everybody likes to leave their um, tall grasses untrimmed and brown um, throughout the season, but it can um, provide a lot of good habitat for birds, food sources throughout the year, nest material. So kind of think about that. It might not be your personal taste or your personal choice because you think it looks messy, but that's just something to think about. All right, so I'm going to go through some three specific pictures and I'll talk a little bit about um, the birds that might visit them or what their, their uh, fruits or um, their food source might be. We talked about red columbine. Look at how beautiful. It's so unique. It is an Illinois native. It kind of checks all those boxes for me. I think, and it comes in, a, there's, this is red columbine. There are other varieties that still grow really well in Illinois. You just want to check and make sure they're not invasive. There's someone down my street that has bright yellow columbines that are really pretty, but they still attract the birds with the red corollas on the inside. But you can really see in this picture, I'm going to see if I can, uh, I usually can get a pointer. I don't know how to do that today, but um, oh, I guess not. Uh, so this is uh, the, the inside. Oh, I don't, I guess I didn't want to do that. I'll erase it. Go away. Um, so this inside of the flower, you can see where it would hold the nectar in these little compartments and the hummingbird can stick its little, um, its little pipette, its little turkey baster right inside of that. Uh, and it'll, and the, you can see down here, all the nectar will be back in this plant. And then it's the, serving the plant's purpose because it will um, rub against those stamens and, um, and, get all the pollen and bring it to the next plant. So everybody's winning in here, including us because the columbines are beautiful. Now I've messed it up. Let's see if I can get back here. Um, there we go. Flowering dogwood. I did talk about this briefly. Um, flowering dogwood again is great because uh, it has beautiful flowers. It's an early uh, flowering uh, tree or, sh or shrub. Um, and it provides nectar, it provides um, shelter, and then it will also, it'll provide bugs because bugs will visit it, you know, uh, insects will visit it to pollinate it in early spring, and then those insects will then attract birds um, that eat insects. Like I said, it's beautiful, and then it will provide red um, fruit um, during the uh, winter. So this is an example of, or I'm sorry, fall. This is an example of fall bearing fruit. So and it will attract all sorts of different types of birds that will come and eat this fruit. Um, those cedar waxwings that I talked about are a great example. So um, that's a good, a good thing to keep in mind. And then the next one here is service berry. Um, and service berry is a, a summer bearing fruit. This is a shrub. Again, it's an Illinois native, has beautiful flowers, um, has this beautiful purpley, um, uh, what's your majig here? foliage, leaves, um, and, and it's a great, I think a great sheltering uh, tree, but then also it'll be fruit, uh, it'll attract fruits um, all throughout the summer. I went back to flowering dogwood. Okay, where are we going now? All right, so we talked a little bit about the um, sources that I used for this presentation. A lot of those resources that I talked about um, are in the, or in all of the resources I talked about are in the chat. Um, so these links are great. Like I said, that Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center has a great search feature. Um, you can search by what color you want, 
what type of flower, when it flowers, how high it gets, what type of uh, soil it needs. So it's a really, really good um, search function uh, that can help you figure out what you want. And it has lots of great pictures. So you can see, get a good, I'm a, such a visual person. So if you have a hard time picturing something, if you just reading it is not gonna work for you, just like it's not gonna work for me. Um, and then, so I guess kind of to wrap everything up, uh, to return to, you want to choose the plants that are reflect the bird species you want to see. If you want to see northern flickers, you're going to have to provide some oak species with good nesting habitats and acorns, and then also have, it'll have to have some dead trees nearby that it can go try to find some grubs and things like that. So you have to really think about what your yard is suitable for um, and what you can plant that could provide these sources. So um, really choose the plants that will, your birds will visit. If you want to look it up, you say, I want this specific bird, start at the bird and trace it back to what kind of food sources it needs. Um, so just really, uh, you have to kind of think about the bird first maybe. Um, you can also think about if I want this color plant or if I want this height plant, I need a shrub and I want that shrub to have fruit so that birds can come, then you can go that way as well. Um, and avoid invasives. Like we talked about, we want to provide healthy habitats for birds um, and other animals and other plants, Illinois native plants. So for, um, planting things that are native species or at least non-invasive species, there's plenty of non-native plants that are not invasive that you can do really well. So um, just kind of do a little research before you plant them just to make sure that everything, everything's gonna be happy in the, in the end result. And that's it. I'm so thirsty. I talk so much. Are there good questions out there, Donna? Yes, there are. So I can start you off as soon as you get your drink. I, I just took another drink and I'm ready to go. Okay. Well, our first question is, I've had Orioles off and on this year and love them. Do you have any suggestions to keep them around? Sure. So if you want to keep them around for sure, the number one way is always going to be um, a guarantee is going to be to have a jelly planter or put some citrus out. Um, let me do a quick just search um, for Oriole food sources um, and to give some good uh, suggestions, but they do a lot of nectar. So um, any of these nectar bearing plants are potentially going to be good for Orioles as well, but their beaks have to be able to get into them. Um, they don't have quite as narrow of a beak as like a um, as a hummingbird does. So you're going to have to think about that. Um, let me do a little searching while we look in the, um, while we have some other questions and, uh, and I will get back to you. Okay. Your next question. If I am attracting pollinators, will I also attract birds that are predators of these insects? Is, is there an alternative good supply of food I can offer birds? So, um, so yeah, so they, if, if it's a bird that's only going to eat insects, um, it's probably never going to eat anything else, if you think about it that way. Um, if you are um, going to, so if you are going to, uh, pro, you know, attract pollinators like butterflies, um, unfortunately, you are going to always get bird species, but you can kind of say, oh, I've been seeing these bird species that are preying on my pollinators, um, and you can kind of look up what those birds eat and attract something else. But a lot of times, if it's like, like a tufted titmouse, it's going to eat everything. So um, they're going to be omnivores and a variety of food sources is always going to help. So you can always put additional feeders out um, because a lot of birds are omnivores and will eat a lot of different things. Um, so you can put out different feeders or you can um, try to plant some additional things or you can provide um, kind of uh, like a barrier, like a physical barrier almost or a, a netting or something like that if you have pollinators that you're bringing in that the pollinator can get through the netting, but the bird can't get through it. So it's just a kind of a suggestion. Okay. Are there birds that eat black walnuts? I purchase peanuts in the shell um, that, to offer birds in my yard. Should I be purchasing other kinds of nuts? Um, there are nut mixes. I mean, peanuts are great. Um, you can also get the suet feeders, um, the suet mix that has nut pieces in it. Those are great and will attract a variety of different birds. Um, woodpeckers especially love suet, um, but a lot of different things. Um, we've had um, uh, catbirds, gray catbirds that have been coming to our suet this year for the first time. Um, and, uh, but 
that's a suggestion and they do have nut pieces. Um, any sort of birds eat anything, man. And they will love that you have shelled a black walnut because that's hard to do. And you took that work right away from them. So they would love that. Um, I mean, any variety, you don't want to go broke. And nuts are expensive to feed birds because they will eat them. They will eat them all and they will be gone. Um, so if you can definitely, whatever works for your budget, you can definitely put it out and birds will come and get it. Okay. But they will eat black walnuts. All right. I really need to cut back my overgrown dogwood shrubs. If I do this in winter, like November, will the birds be finished with them? Um, the best thing to do would be to make sure that um, if the fruits are gone, the birds will not be eating them. So keep an eye on those red um, or whatever fruit, a color fruit your dogwood has. You can check for the berries, um, check for those. Uh, and if the fruit's gone, then yes. Otherwise you can put those, um, the cutoffs in a special area and the birds will still visit them. Um, but also check for live nests. Um, you know, we can't really move nests, but um, if the birds, you know, done, done with it, all the babies are gone, they will rebuild a nest the next year. So you don't feel like you have to be held hostage um, that, you know, by your, by birds either. You know, it has to work for you. Your yard, you know, your yard has to work, but, but the dogwood, once the fruits are gone, the birds will move on to something else. All right, is it true that birds have better color vision than humans? Uh, is it good to plant the right color for the right bird? And are flashes of white a signal of danger for birds? It's really going to depend on the species of bird. Um, if you have a specific species in mind, red is always going to attract, um, like even if you have red things, like I have red feeders and the hummingbirds will come up to the red feeder because they see the red um, and, and they will see the red and then they'll check to see if it's a nectar a nectar feeder or not. So uh, red is definitely an attractant to birds. I have not heard that white is flashes of white is danger. Now, a lot of times um, you'll have a uh, reflective material because that is distracting. Um, the, the flashes of light is distracting to birds. So that might be what you're thinking of because sometimes they'll put up hanging CDs or, or um, reflective um, like flagging tape to keep like pigeons away from an area or something like that um, to uh, uh, discourage birds from nesting in a specific area. I have a quick Oriole answer for you. I did a little research and the Audubon Society says that um, things like trumpet vines, Orioles will eat, uh, will visit the basically any nectar rich plant. So trumpet vines, um, honeysuckle, tr hu trumpet honeysuckle, but be very careful because some varieties of honeysuckle, even though they're native, they are very invasive. They will grow up in your foundation. So keep an eye on honeysuckle. Um, and, uh, but anything like a, like even like a um, clematis, things like that, that have lots of nectar, um, you can add them to just about anywhere. And they also love, um, uh, Orioles love shallow water forgot that when you asked before. So like a shallow bird feeder, Orioles don't like anything deeper than two inches. So keep that in mind. Okay, next please. Okay, I we actually are at the end of our chat right. questions, but you just made me think of something about the bird nests. Mm -hmm. Where else do I need to look for um, bird nests and check to be sure? I mean, I'm sure the babies would be gone Mm -hmm. by the cold months, but am I dislodging birds that are planning to stay for the winter? What should I be watching for? So if like one thing that um, like it might arbor, I used to have some arbor vitae's out front. Um, birds always used to nest in those. Any bird that's going to be spending the winter is going to be looking for something that's non-deciduous usually. It's going to be looking for something that's either going to be inside of a tree um, or like um, some birds will bring, you know, big bundles together and, and put them in a nook of a tree. But um, a lot of times evergreens are going to be your areas that birds are overwintering in. So it's going to be protected. So if you have an evergreen shrub or something like that, um, that you want to trim down, that would be definitely something to take a look at. But birds are, the, you know, wind could knock down a bird nest. Predators could knock down a bird, bird's nest. So birds are really adaptable and can make a new nest. Now, if it's already the middle of winter and you're considering knocking a tree down, that could really damage, you know, something for a bird because it would have to rebuild it, build it very fast. But most of the time when we're doing things, it's, it's early fall, things like that. So I would hope that any bird is adaptable enough to be able to make something happen in that amount of time. Does that make sense? 
Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And I see that we have another comment, and I absolutely agree. It says, Natalie, you are the best online speaker. My vote is for more programs from Natalie. You teach us something new every time. And thank you for sharing your knowledge. And well, talent. thank you. That's, that's so great to hear. Well, Donna and I were already talking about some stuff. So we'll kind of throw some ideas together about some different stuff that we could potentially do. Um, but I'm glad, I'm glad people get things out of it. And um, this is our last one for a little bit, but I'm very excited to, to be here and, and do this for you guys. So thank you very much. And thank you, Natalie. And Meg, did you have anything else uh, before I share my screen again for the next program? I do not. Thank you for asking, Donna. Um, I just want to say that Natalie is a very talented and intelligent uh, master gardener volunteer. And I am super glad that she's in the program. And if you enjoy what Natalie does and you feel like you want to get into this kind of thing, please um, feel free to reach out to me at University of Illinois Extension in our Ottawa office. And thank you Absolutely. so much to those who have been here for the past Did we lose you, Meg? Well, I'm just going to go here and um, share my screen one last time. And there it is. For anyone interested in this wonderful NASA program, um, and you'll be able to ask Joel Knapper questions. He is great. Um, he does a lot of programs for us, and I hope you'll be able to join us Maybe we'll even have a night sky that we can talk about then that doesn't have clouds in it. Donna, really quick question about this program. Is it for adults or can kids come or? Um, it's for adults and I would say um, any kids that are interested in space. So okay. even a seven-year-old would probably enjoy it. Absolutely. And Absolutely. you know, there's, and I, there, I believe there's a spacewalk tomorrow uh, on the ISS. So um, you might want to check the NASA yeah, absolutely. That. We've got some space nuts here. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I think that concludes our program for tonight. Thank you all for joining us. Please send us your ideas. We'd love to put programs on that you can share with us. So I'll say good night and hope to see you on July 7th. Thanks everybody, have a good night. Thank you very much. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, Donna. Thank you. Bye-bye.